Thanks for watching this video on Global Accessibility Awareness Day. In this video, we will be meeting with a couple of our accessibility experts to discuss the various challenges in accessibility testing and what it's like to work with a tester who has disabilities. I'd like to introduce Nicholas and Abdul. Hello, I am Nicholas and I am the project manager for accessibility testing at PlusQA. And hello, my name is Abdul, and I'm a QA analyst with the accessibility testing team at PlusQA. To begin, let's start with why you think accessibility testing is important. I'll take this one. Um, well, the first is the moral perspective, which is that it's the right thing to do. Um, accessibility non-compliance means exclusion of a lot of people. Um, the second is practical. Uh, one out of every four people living in the United States self-identifies having a disability. Um, that's 25% of the population uh, that have a significant buying power. Um, people with disabilities have a significant amount of influence uh, on the consumer uh, choices of friends and family who are not disabled. Um, and so these are important considerations. Uh, business considerations um, uh, as to why one should actually pursue accessibility. Um, From a technical standpoint, um, if you assume that accessibility is something that needs to be included in your project, um, it's much like functionality or UI testing, uh, any growing backlog of bugs uh, is increasing your tech technical debt and getting to them sooner rather than later is only going to help uh, get to the eventual compliance. Um, and on the note of assuming that it is necessary, there is a strong legal precedent set now for digital accessibility being a requirement. Uh, so yeah, it's always it's, it's, uh, better sooner rather than later. Why is automated testing not enough for accessibility testing? And why do you think it is valuable to have people with disabilities on your team? So as far as the automation portion of that question goes, um, I think the automation is a very useful tool. And even in accessibility, it can, uh, it can take care of a, a decent amount of work for you. Uh, things like contrast values, we're talking about color contrast. Uh, you can automatically check color values uh, and make sure that they're within the right range. Uh, you can check HTML formatting uh, with automation and really a pretty wide array of things. Uh, and that is great and definitely worth looking into. Uh, I would say uh, because of the complexity of accessibility issues, um, automation is, should be thought of as supplementary uh, when, when testing accessibility. I think right now the standing number is something like 30% of issues might be caught by automation. Um, and that would probably be on a good week. Uh, and the rest of the testing would be done manually. Um, so yeah, I think that automation is a, is a fine tool, but uh, having people analyzing these accessibility problems that are present in a lot of software today, uh, it requires a, a human mind still, at, at least now. Um, as far as uh, why it's valuable to have people with disabilities on, on your team or on my team specifically, I think I could uh, defer to Abdul on that one. Yeah, I, I would say that uh, our team comprised of primarily sighted testers um, do phenomenal work in accessibility testing. Um, we use the uh, web content accessibility guidelines as um, as a rubric uh, for testing um, and um, have been really quite effective with that as a, as a framework. Um, as a, a blind tester, um, I feel that I am able to bring um, added perspective uh, to um, you know, e evaluating accessibility issues. Uh, for me, accessibility challenges um, are very much a lived experience. Um, and, and I think in some ways the team um, uh, is able to benefit um, from kind of analyzing accessibility issues that may not fit 
uh, cleanly within the rubric of the WCAG. Yeah, it's a valuable perspective to have on the team. I, I think that it's one thing to read these fairly technical, fairly dry uh, web content accessibility guidelines, which, which are great, um, and presume to know how they should be implemented in software and what a user who maybe is blind uh, needs from the software. Uh, but it's a, an entirely different and better thing to have somebody who has lived that experience confirm and assist you in, in figuring out exactly how to categorize uh, accessibility violations and also maybe how to flag things that you might not associate with you know, rule 1.3.1 1. Uh, on any given, uh, with any given issue. So what would you recommend for someone who has disabilities if they wanted to get into the IT field? I think the first uh, thing that I would say is, um, you know, be curious, be humble, uh, be open, be eager. Uh, that's advice that I would give to anybody, um, disabled or no. Uh, the second is that if you feel that you're qualified for a job, then apply for that job. Um, and the third is that if you're called into an interview, um, it is true that uh, employers are not allowed to ask you about your disability, but that does not mean that they don't have questions in their head about uh, your disability. And so you want to create a space where you can discuss uh, and talk about your abilities um, as somebody who actually has a disability. Um, I think that uh, that kind of information uh, really goes a long way uh, toward um, a positive outcome um, uh, for the interview. Uh, the fourth and final thing is that, so let's say that you've been hired and, um, and perhaps you're apprehensive about uh, what you may have to offer your team. And I think the thing to, to bear in mind is um, that you have uh, a perspective that is unparalleled. Um, disabled individuals have been using technology uh, uh, that's been at the leading edge for a very, very long time. Uh, and way before these technologies have been mainstreamed. Uh, Text-to-speech uh, has been used by the blind and visually impaired since the early 1980s. Um, motor impaired individuals have been using uh, speech recognition since the mid-1990s. Um, and these technologies have now been mainstreamed in you know, personal digital assistants like Amazon Alexa or Google Home or Siri. Um, today, we talk about uh, how we can use augmented reality, artificial intelligence and wearables um, you know, to, uh, to enrich our lives in the future. Um, and disabled individuals are living that future now. Um, and so this is, this is unique insight uh, that you can bring into a team uh, that is focused on innovation. And um, you know, a team that uh, values innovation is a team that values that kind of insight. So what do you enjoy about working with the Plus QA accessibility team? It feels like my team's business goals are based off of compassion and inclusion. Um, which can be kind of hard to find in a position sometimes. Uh, and it makes going to work fairly easy. I don't need to think up reasons to go to work. It's, it's pretty clear cut. And uh, it's also pretty fun to analyze these, uh, these scenarios with, with constraints on them. It's, it's, it's an enjoyable position. Yeah, I don't have much to add to that. Uh, I agree with it uh, all. Um, I, I would say that, um, the abbreviation that we uh, use for our team is ally, and this is an abbreviation for accessibility. Um, but the you know word ally is, is apt. Um, I feel that uh, every day when I come to work, uh, that I am among allies, uh, people who are committed to the cause of advancing accessibility in the digital space. Um, and um, it's it's lovely that I have uh, these individuals as my colleagues and and my friends. Um, so, yeah. That is a, a big part of what makes it enjoyable is that 
we can say that we are at least doing our best to to help uh, make software accessible and make sure that everybody can use uh, all kinds of different uh, services that are in the digital space. What are the challenges in testing that you have experienced so far on both web and mobile apps? There are always challenges in on any QA team. Uh, and uh, most of those are in common with an accessibility testing team, but there are a couple of unique challenges that you might face with accessibility testing. Um, a good example of uh, one of these challenges might be uh, the way that UI components are named. Um, there can sometimes be sort of a, a disconnect in the terminology. Uh, UI components often are named after their visual counterparts in real life. Uh, for example, you might call a UI component a card because it is shaped like a postcard. Uh, that isn't going to mean very much to a user who is blind. Uh, that, that, that information won't be present to them. Uh, so that can be a challenge. Uh, I know that we've, we've uh, you know, especially writing tests, make sure that I'm, I'm not saying like, go to the card here, because that, that just doesn't mean anything to a screen reader. Um, so that's definitely a challenge to, to, to be aware of. Um, and I would say that there, there are a few other scenarios, I mean, Differences between platforms is is another thing. I know that in functionality testing, you're always going to see differences uh, between maybe like a, a, a native mobile platform and a and a web platform. And some of these issues are augmented in the accessibility realm. If you have typically a web page can have quite a bit more to it than a smaller mobile application. Might be just a more complex page, more menu items. Uh, more ways to leave the page. Um, and with all that complexity, that often will translate to an information overload for a screen reader and screen reader user. Uh, hard to parse through all of it and make heads, heads or tails of what's happening on that screen. On the other hand, on a native device, you might not have that problem. This constraint of size will often make the UI more simplified, so that's fine. But also those constraints will uh, pare down functionality uh, that might have been useful to a screen reader. So it's, it's tricky to find a balance. Um, and you, know, you find that differences between platforms might, might uh, cause some interesting accessibility uh, issues that, to, to navigate. At what stage of a project should someone consider accessibility testing to be part of their plan? Why do you think accessibility testing is a subject that product managers, designers, and developers need to consider on every project? I know we've talked about this. Abdul and I have talked about this quite a bit. I, I guess I'll, I'll let Abdul take the, uh, the design phase. <laughs> well, yeah, I was going to say every phase of the yeah. <laughs> uh, project. <laughs> um, but the design phase certainly sets uh, the tone uh, for uh, the entire process. Um, it informs how um, engineers will go about implementing, um, you know, the um, implementing the designs. It informs how, uh, you know, uh, QA, um, you know, uh, teams will uh, go about assessing, um, you know, accessibility um, when a product. And so, um, this is this is crucial because I think that considering accessibility. You know, at you know only at phases following the design phase, um, often you know uh, means um, accrued technical debt. Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of companies probably find themselves in this situation where where they they feel like, well, we already have a product; we're not building it from scratch here, and uh, we just want to make sure that what we have is accessible. But it's pretty rare to find a company that is is not working on something new in their software realm. Um, and the sooner that you get your design team on board with accessibility, the, the sooner you kind of just like put a block in the, in, in the large amount of new accessibility violations that you're going to find that's not kept in mind in the design phase. Um, beyond design, uh, certainly just like you would with functionality testing, 
on that Abdul and I both do a lot of this. Uh, we call pre-release testing, but just really uh, making sure stuff works before it gets released. Um, it's just as important for accessibility as it is for functionality or UI testing. Um, and maybe more so, especially right now, well, probably a lot of companies are getting their developers trained in accessibility or, or maybe don't have like a, a, a ton of expertise in accessibility yet. Um, I think that making sure that you have somebody who, who knows what to look for looking over your software uh, before it's released is, is really important. Um, you know, it's the old adage of how much more expensive it is to, to fix bugs after they've been pushed into production. You lose business money just from customers and you, you lose developer hours from triaging it back into to the engineering phase. Uh, and uh, when you add the fact that you need this extra level exper expertise in accessibility development and just know how and how to make sure that you're following the WCAGs, uh, it's, uh, it's almost more important to make sure that you pre-release testing with accessibility. Um, I guess the last phase, at least major uh, piece of the software development, as far as the QA team is concerned, um, and where you would want to involve accessibility testing, sort of uh, uh, is the after release or what a lot of people call regression testing. It's, it's probably a good idea to at least periodically audit software after it's been released, especially uh, we're in a stage right now where a lot of companies are pushing for accessibility but aren't quite there um, and I don't have a ton of experience maintaining compliance. Uh, so it's going to be quite useful to just make sure you're taking a look back in. Uh, things break in production all the time from a lot of moving parts in large software and uh, accessibility issues are no exception. And as we were saying before for pre-release testing, sometimes they can be fairly time consuming to fix, but they need to be fixed. Uh, so yeah, these periodic audits will save a lot of trouble and maybe even just light regression testing that's ongoing uh, is, is a wise move. These are all services that PlusQA does provide. Uh, we we can review designs and make sure that they're headed in the right direction uh, from an accessibility standpoint. Um, we can advise and help revise these things so that you reduce the amount of time engineers spend having to go back and fix these things, but the designers have to spend revamping their designs all over again uh, because you know, some guideline wasn't kept in mind. Uh, There's a, a lot of time spent and it's fairly frustrating. Uh, we also test a lot of pre-release pre -release, uh, accessibility testing. It's, uh, it's a huge part of what we do, um, preventing things from getting out there into production, uh, especially right now uh, in this current climate, uh, legally speaking, it's good to have the peace of mind that you're not releasing accessibility violations uh, into your production. Uh, and a great way to start your process of, uh, of getting up to compliance um, and getting some sort of assurance that, that uh, you're not at risk uh, in the accessibility realm is starting with an audit and then maybe just having recurring audits going on uh, into, into the future uh, until they're not necessary anymore, um, which is something that we, we often start off with with a client. Are there legal consequences for not including accessibility? Well, plus QA is not a law firm and uh, we're not legal practitioners uh, here. Uh, what we can say is uh, that there is um, mounting legal risk uh, associated with uh, non-compliance um, to accessibility standards and um, the WCAG, or Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, uh, is a recognized standard uh, in case law here in the United States. Um, Nicholas, do you have more to add? Yeah, those, those WCAGs, I mean, those are what we base most of our work off of. Uh, as, uh, of course, it's on all of our clients' minds that there is some legal risk involved in this field now, and 
um, those guidelines do have standing in court. Um, so while we don't provide legal advice per se, the, the guidelines that we do follow are the legal precedent. So that's helpful. Um, I would also say just, just to address the risk of not having any form of accessibility testing or design review. Um, since 2013, I think from 2013 to 2018, there has been a massive jump in federal cases uh, to do with accessibility law uh, in the digital space. I believe it's a 273% increase from 2013 to 2018. So that's certainly something that is is worth mitigating that risk uh, as it's, it's, a, it's a common topic in the courts these days. Nicholas, how has your perception and process about accessibility testing changed since testers who are blind have joined your team? What has it changed for the team? Well, it's changed quite a few things about how we work as a team. It's, and uh, we, we've modified a few processes. Um, it's also brought a lot of uh, insight to the team. Um, we can very confidently prioritize issues. If I can ask Abdul for his opinion on whether uh, a certain accessibility violation, if it's fixed, if that will have a, a broader impact than, than another one, or you know, from his perspective, what are the most severe issues, what deserve the most attention, that is very helpful insight and perspective that we get from having people with disabilities on our team. Um, our processes have changed in a few ways that I think for the better, I mean, we have to, we write a lot of tests that we can follow along with and we just have to make sure that we're not uh, introducing new tests that rely on cited, uh, that, that rely on, on cited users or use terms that only cited users would make use of. Uh, but, you know, as an accessibility testing team, I think that uh, is probably par, par for the course. <laughs> Thank you, Abdul and Nicholas, for joining us today. Thanks for having us. And thank you for joining us on Global Accessibility Awareness Day. If you have any questions about adding or incorporating accessibility testing to your project, please visit our website or send us an email with your details so we can partner you with our accessibility team. Mm -hmm.